finally, after all that fun with electronics, I use the word fun in the lightest sense, I'm in a position to progress again. I've kind of caught up, everything went wrong, was fixed. So I'm in the position to progress and start adding things instead of just fixing things now. So I'm back to these infrared sensors and I've kind of got some impetus and I'm, I'm making some pretty good progress. I feel like I've done this before but I can't find it anywhere so I'm going to go through again explaining what I'm doing and, and try and explain why. So I've got these uh, uh, storage lines really and you know the, the, the reason for them is so that as is obvious from here I don't have to keep taking trains on and off the layout. Most of the trains I go on I can have on the layout at the same time and I'm not going to box them up and get other ones out. And this was always the space that was designated for the yard and I want to make the most of the use, uh, the most of the space as I possibly can, most use of the space. So as th this um, shows, it, on a lot of the lines I'm going to be doubling up trains, a short one and a long one, there's usually space on, on the layout for that. But if I'm doing that, it adds a bit of complication if I'm going into um, detection, uh, block detection and um, detection of whether there's actually you know a train on a line at any point because if I just had current detectors on any one of these lines and one train was parked on it, say this one down here, the little uh, super sprinter, then the whole block, the whole line would be um, down as, as allocated, as busy and, and, either, and, and the, the layout wouldn't, be, wouldn't choose to park anything else on the end of it. So the way I'm working with these sensors is I'm going to have a number of infrared sensors at, at various positions along the lines so that the layout and I from any, any layout diagram can tell at any point whether there's a long train parked at the front and there's space for a short train at the back, whether there's a short train parked at the front and there's space for a long train behind it, or whether there's a long train and a short train or a short train and a long train parked on the on the line and that there's no space for anything else in order to achieve that i've kind of got to be tactical with a number of infrared sensors along the lines and also the placing of them as well so when i first started experimenting with these infrared sensors i tried to and uh, now this one here where's my finger this one here is meant to be um placed horizontally and it's got these two upward facing sensors um and and on the, the the surface of it this this looks like a, a decent size to fit between sleepers um and there probably is some some use for that maybe you have to cut a bit of a delve in a, in the baseboard but i really struggled with this one and, and coming from underneath what's 12 mil baseboard it didn't have the the oomph to be able to actually detect anything that was 12 mil above it so i pretty much wrote this one off quickly this one's meant to be placed vertically um, and is much more sensitive and, and useful. I think that this this little screw here might adjust sensitivity as well, uh, but I'm not sure about that, I haven't played with it. Um, and I found these to be much more useful um, and, it, and it looks possibly like they will actually work and, and do what I want them to do. Here they are in situ, they, they are a bit green, there's a bit of they they have quite bright green lights on them, unfortunately, uh, which does <laughs> light up the underside of the baseboard a little bit. Um, but that's them. And uh, they're always lit. One light means they're not detecting anything. Two means they are. So if I just above here, uh, wherever that one is, start waving my hand around, see the second light lights up when it senses that I'm above it. And also that's a good example that that the thing is working again and if I just pull this train so it goes over the sensor there we go it's lit it's lit up and it's sensing that something's parked over it so they were my early tests and um <laughs> pretty much constituted the testing I did and it's promising enough to to progress and and see what I can do with them it's obvious from all these holes in the layout that when I first tried placing these infrared sensors I got it a little bit wrong and I got them a little bit too close to the end of the line in this case obviously if you know if if, it, if the train just um, carries on a little bit from crossing the sensor it's going to be onto a short circuit because it's going to end up on a uh, on a set of points that's not set for it so I've, I've moved them back 
I'm still, I think really this one should have gone further back. The rest I'm reasonably happy with, but it's now time to put them to the test. The way I'm going to test it is I've pulled everything back as far as I can, and I'm going to start pulling them forward one by one. But I'm not going to be able to see these lines when I do it. And that's because I'm going to be sat here. So I've, I've ended up with this little chair sort of in the middle of the loft where, and I've, I've put a couple of old tablets up around it. And it, uh, this is going to end up being, or, or somewhere like it actually, because once the station's there, it's kind of going to block that. But I'll find myself a little corner of the loft where I can sit with kind of as much information, digital information in front of me as I can. Um, but obviously when I'm sat down, I'm not necessarily going to be able to see the yard lines because they're over here. And uh, just sort of down down that corner. So I'm going to be sat facing these and I'm going to go purely by the display there, which I'll get closer to in a minute, which should have the sensors attached and those lines should go red when a sensor is, is um, denoting that a line is occupied. Sat in the seat then, this is the display that I can see and I've got my little control thing here that's going to uh, drive the trains so let's start with that one that's selected already the, the class 40 so if I can get hold of all this now I'm doing this with number hands so I might be quite slow but the idea is I'm going to hit stop on my controller as soon as the light um, light lights up for that track that's gone backwards that's not going to help let's take it forwards I'm looking for a light to light up. There it is. Stop. It was terrible reactions, but there, there we go. So now I'm going to go for what else was on there? The Super Sprinter. Let's get that selected. Take that forward and do the same for this one. we go I've hit stop on that one so that's two now I'm gonna go and get the let's go for the APT take that forward that's got derailment but I'll carry on with it anyway now I've started oh, and I missed that but anyway that's be a good test the reactions were terrible on that one and the last one is the class 43 blue grey that's that one, let's take that one forward. And that's lit up as well. So with those four moves, let's go see what damage I did. Over to the front here. So the Super Sprinter, yeah, I was worried about that and that's gone too far forward. I think I'm gonna have to do a second move on that one, although I think I did maybe was that the one where I reacted really badly to it, but I'll, I'm that's too close, obviously f far too close to the end of the line, so that's going to need some looking at. APT is pretty good. There's a decent distance there. The class 40, that's that first hole's misleading. The one it actually went over with the sensor in it is there, and the class 43, the sensor it went over is there. So they're not bad. I'm I'm wondering if. I just had terrible reactions with that one, but it, it is noticeably closer to the end of the line than the other ones. The APT, oh, I won't push that back because it's got derailment. Um, but that's not bad. I think this one is too close to the end. I'm going to have to review that, but the others are looking pretty decent. I've now encountered another problem in, the, in moving the sensors, say, from there to there. I'm moving them further away from where they all plug in down there in the Arduino and the cables were always pretty tight so I've found with one I'm just trying to move now uh, uh, this one that the cable that it's on isn't long enough to get to its new hole I think it's time because it's actually moving towards another board now this board doesn't have an Arduino on it it's an extension board that has an RS485 there's a couple of um, not RS-45, there's a, a, a couple of these servo driver boards, it's PCA 9685 boards chained together, so this is like the second in a, a chain of boards that are connected to the Arduino and then there's a, a relay block down there as well. 
but this block has its own 5 volt power supply. There's obviously nothing here that I can plug uh, the signal cable into, but I could plug the power cable into it. And actually, there are going to be a lot of uh, sensors sort of further along because there's going to be three per line. So I'm thinking now might be a good time to put my little homemade extension, power extension, 5 volt extension block to the test. Again, if these things actually exist commercially, if someone knows what they're called, because I can't find them, it's a very botched job, it's a bit of a prototype, but I have multimetered it. And the idea is, each of these lines of pins is shared, and they're shared by this big lump of solder on the bottom. And obviously I've checked continuity between the two lines, that they're not connected, in case some solder had drifted into that channel on the on the bottom. Um, and tested so each of these pins is connected to each other each of these pins is connected to each other but there's no continuity between the two lines so the idea would be I'll pull a 5 volt supply because there'll be a few spares in this uh, board here this is this will have a few because it well yeah for reasons I've got into before it, it has a bunch of spare 5 volts down here so I'll pull a couple of cables plug them into this and then use this as a kind of power extension for all of the well anything that gets plugged in along here it's going to be mainly sensors um, so that then I only have to drag one cable all the way over to, to there and actually moving forward when I get the next lot of sensors in which will probably be around here somewhere I'm then thinking of using input shift registers which will mean actually for all however many eight nine sensors that that will be in this area i'll actually only need to pull one or two cables i'll have power for it all here anyway because i'm going to get this thing plugged in so the only cables that will go all the way along to the arduino will be the cables that plug the shift register in and i think that's only one or two i thought it might be a good idea if i'm getting onto shift registers to just stop for a second and maybe talk about the how and the why the why the reason why i'm looking at using input shift registers is i'm already getting a lot of traffic here on these cables and there was a, a, a really interesting constructive comment on one of the previous videos i posted i think by jason and and because i was talking about how how difficult it is to plug these cables into these pins once the thing's mounted up there that's still a fried one up there but soon it'll get removed and this one will go in its place and once they're up there and I start adding more sensors, I find it really hard to navigate through all these cables that are already plugged in and get more cables plugged into these tiny little pins next to each other. Um, and, and one thing that came out of that conversation is actually the, of these, each pin has a set of three or each group has a set of three pins in it. But two of those pins are voltage and ground and they're shared anyway right across the whole thing. So there's not really much point in extending those. The signal pin, the, the S, is the one that we really need to extend. So maybe just get down to extending one one of those pins instead of three and that, that will reduce some of the traffic around here which will really help. But I'm also looking at, as I've started doing here, like this is an extension number 37, I'm going to get extension cables plugged in before I mount it so that I know once it's mounted I'm never going to have to mess with pins here unless one falls out or something but I'm never going to have anything to add in anymore because I can add them in down on these extensions down here and I've started doing that and I haven't got far to go but then I started thinking about distance so I'm going to have sensors if, if I come up a little bit there are going to be sensors all the way down there and okay there is an Arduino down the other end as well so they'll that'll cables will start coming from that end to the middle but the ones in the middle that's still long distance and actually there's going to be one sensor for every line so that's nine sensors and that's a, a lot of cable to pull and it's a lot of long cables to come in here already with it very being very cluttered and, and go into there so what what a shift register would give me, or an input shift register in, in this case, would it would allow me to chain, kind of little, have, have little input hubs dotted maybe between each truss down there or wherever, um, and it would take four cables from here, so four cables go maybe to the next truss along, and they are connected to an input shift register, and they, that has eight inputs. So I could have eight sensors on that next truss, plugged into the shift register, and the shift register plugged into here but then the shift registers can chain so for the next truss along 
I wouldn't have to pull cables from here anymore. I would just pull cables from the last shift register. So therefore, I'm chaining, there's no more cables coming here, I'm chaining another four cables from shift register one to shift register two, which is further along, and that gives me another eight inputs on the next truss along, and along I go, and I'm not continually pulling long cables back into here. There is a performance compromise with them because it's uh, it becomes serial data. This is what's known as parallel data because you've got all these pins, say pins four to eight, and if you've got a sensor plugged into each of those, then they're parallel they're connected at the same time whereas with serial the shift register has eight connections and they're parallel but they're communicated to the arduino one bit at a time which becomes serial and it's just going into one pin there are advantages obviously it saves you pins you get more inputs than you've got pins um and it's it's going to save me a lot of cabling but there could be a performance compromise that i'll have to assess but at this stage, it's definitely worth looking into for the amount of cabling that it will save me. Here then, I'm just testing two shift reg registers chained together and feeding into a, a Arduino Uno. So there are four data cables. It's all very well documented. Four, four cables coming out of the Arduino Uno. They're there on 8, 9, 11 and 12. And they feed into the relevant pins on the input side of the board that has the input shift register connected to it. The input shift register is actually just a little chip in the middle of there. This is a board that I got from China. They're, they cost about a pound each with the chip on them and it just makes the, them so much easier to work with. I did buy just a couple of the bare input register chips and the, the amount of work it takes to get them on the layout is a pain. So for a, for a pound for the chip and the board and the pins, it just seems to make sense. So it's coming in, these four cables at the top, the yellow ones, two yellow, green and black, are coming into this shift register. The shift register then has an input from a infrared sensor on that blue cable there. And then four cables are going back out, the two at the bottom are ground and, and uh, five volts. There are then four cables coming out of the shift register and into a second shift register, which is over here. And this starts to form a chain and obviously you can just keep going on and on and on and on. And there's one cable coming out of the, on down this side, these are the inputs. So each shift register has eight inputs and there's another infrared sensor sat into that one. So I've got one, the first shift register has eight inputs, but it only has one sensor connected. The second, shift register has eight inputs and only has one connected. Obviously each could have eight. So the general idea now is it sort of works like gravity in that imagine these shift registers piled on top of each other and each holds eight values and has capacity for eight values. So what happens when I run the code on the Arduino and it's pretty much there's a couple of prep lines but it's pretty much just one one line shift in shift in once the gate has been opened will take eight values from the first shift register this one but in taking those eight values it kind of empties the holes where those eight values were so the eight that are in this one fall into this one so the eight that were originally in here have fallen into the Arduino created capacity and the eight that were in there have fallen into this one. So if I do the shift in command twice on the Arduino, I get initially the first shift in gets me a byte with the eight values of these pins along here, or the, the ones that are connected to the, the chip. That creates a big space in this shift register, which the eight values from this one fall into. So if I do another shift in on the Arduino, the eight that came from there when the first eight moved in fall into the Arduino. And in two commands, I have six, well, two bytes, each with eight values, which represent the state of these pins at the point when they were shifted in. And then there's a little command that set, comes back that, that sets them to, to start sensing on their, their pins again and stop trying to send. So I guess now it's time to go and look at the code. Here then at the computer, 
I've got a simple sketch. It's always best I started with a simple sketch. Obviously, what I don't want to do is because there's so many variables, even with the shift register, I don't want to just kind of incorporate into the code for the node straight away. So I've got a simple kind of debugging type thing. A lot of this code is is just available on the internet, and I've I've copied and, and pasted it. Um, it does this once in its setup, but let's go on to the loop. Um, it does here what it's doing effectively these these first few lines is it's telling the shift registers to freeze to stop reading values into the pins from the sensors freeze the value in the pins uh, and be ready to transfer the values in those pins into the arduino when when asked and then down here this is when we're asked so we're saying we have a byte called incoming one we have two shift registers so shift in the first shift in will bring the eight values from the closest shift register to the computer and it will effectively then empty the values in the shift register which will create capacity for the eight values in the shift register above to fall into the closest one so that's what's happened here we've brought the eight values in it's emptied the eight values from the shift register and the eight from the next one along have fallen in so if we then do shift in again we get eight the eight values from the second shift register in the chain and you'd keep going through this if you had five you do five of these values and you'd end up with five bytes with the values of the five shift registers and then there's just a quick bit of uh, code here that simply detects whether the value that we've we've brought for each shift register has changed from what it used to be before and if it has it it uh, outputs it to the console just so that the count console is a little bit uh, tidier Let's put this to the test then. We've got a blank console here because nothing's currently changing, but I think it's all live and it's going and I've got my sensors just over here. So I'll do my best to, uh, well actually no, I'm not gonna be able to do it. So we've got one here that's connected to, that's connected to the first sensor. So we should see changes on byte one here. If we move this, the light is currently on the sense light. So if I move it so that the light is off, We've had a change here. In fact, no, I changed two. This must be, or I moved them both, who knows. But this is number one, I think. So it is. it should be because it's got cables on. This is number one because it's got cables on both ends. So if I start changing this, there we go. Finger on, finger off, just like this. And on the console, we're seeing that change on from a zero to a one on byte one. Again, we have eight bits on this shift register, but this sensor is plugged into the first bit. So again, in converting to string and the output that we see on the screen, it's just removing leading zeros. So the actual byte that's being read in is zero 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 one, but those leading zeros are being removed. This sensor, however, is plugged into number eight on wherever it's into pin eight. So this is the last sensor on the, uh, the last input on the board. So we should see slightly different input. If I grab this and start to uh, sense it, the light comes on, here we go. What's happening here, because it's the effectively the last one, when we go to what, here, I'm moving the other one as well. So byte two, when I, when this one goes to positive, it's cost the leftmost bit of the eight, the most significant bit. So we're, we're getting, we see that one's being changed, but all of the other pins on there are still st staying with a value of zero. So that is two shift registers chained together and ready now to test on the layer. Here now is the same setup up there. This is the shift register that was there before, connected to the Arduino, which is over there. And that has those first four sensors on it, but it now has an extension coming out of it. Those four cables, the green, blue, purple, whatever they are. And that goes into a second shift register here, which has a sensor attached to it. So the idea would be I can wave my hand over this sensor and down here, we're seeing a change on byte two. 
because that's the second shift register. in the chain and I can also wave my hand if I wave my hand over this one this should be on bike one so that's it fundamentally working now it's just a case of getting it um, plumbed into the code for for the the actual CMRI node Back to the code then, and this is the code I wrote that just does the, the debug analysis of the values coming from the shift registers. Um, and the important thing to note before I go back onto my CMRI node code sketch is these uh, delay microseconds here. Now I'm assuming what, what these are for is part of the process of, of loading data in from the shift register is this pulsing of the load pin. Now I'm assuming that these delays are here so that the pulse is long enough for the uh, shift register to register that there was a pulse maybe if this delay wasn't there and it just went low high really quickly it wouldn't register that there was a pulse and wouldn't prepare for data transfer I don't know but that's just an assumption I've made I haven't looked into into that but I want to avoid putting these delays in my uh, CMRI node sketch because I don't really want it even for five milliseconds if I can avoid it it's going to in, to some extent affect performance and I really don't want to do it so what I've done is because my um, my code is already so here's the, the bit right at the end so the last thing it does in the loop is it, it does this um, this transfer here and um, you'll notice here that the low um, switch is commented out and the delays the reason why I've done that is I've assumed that because so much other stuff happens in this sketch now each time it goes through the loop that if I set that uh, pulse at the start of the loop by the time it's gone through all this other gubbins that it needs to do and gets to the end of the loop which is where it does the reading from the shift register all the way down here then probably five microseconds will have passed anyway. Um, I've tested this, it works. I, I really don't know if I'm doing the right thing or not, but sometimes if it seems to work, it is the right thing. So it sets it back to high here and then assumes that the pulse has happened. Uh, does the, its other little setup bits to get ready for data transfer. Then we have two micro, uh, we have two shift registers connected to this Arduino so it's it says right data one I mean if, if I ended up with more maybe I'd start using an array of bytes something like that but for the time being just for two this is perfectly uh, acceptable um, so data one is the load of values from the first shift register in the chain which is the one that has those four infrared sensors close to the end of the uh, anti-clockwise storage lines then data 2 is the second shift register the one I've just added further along which has that one that's in the middle after the short train and there's only one sensor attached to that at the minute um, and then this is the kind of the really nifty clever bit here the uh, Arduino CMRI libraries have a set byte um, function as well so all I'm saying here is set byte 5 to data 1 and set byte six to the, the byte I got from shift register two. Previously all all the work I'd done with um, setting sensor values in CMRI had been in bits so they were always it was zero index uh, array and if I want to set the value of the fifth micro sensor say then I set bit five. This is slightly different because we're dealing with bytes and a byte has eight binary values in it so when I set byte five um, that's the uh, and that's the byte index not the bit index um, I'm setting eight binary values on, in byte five and I'm setting eight binary values in, in byte six. So the way I would map this in Arduino in the Arduino in, in JMRI effectively when I'm adding the sensor, it's a zero indexed array of bytes, well bits, um, but we're going eight at a time. So eight fives are forty. So the first sensor in my yard on anti clockwise line one would have a hardware address in JMRI of 1041 because it's on node 1 and it's the 41th 41st binary value because there were 5 bytes of 8 bits before it so 8 5 is 40 next one along is 41 this in this case 
we're, go we're going to do six eights, which I really can't do. If the previous one was 40, it's be 48. So that that sensor I just added halfway along will will be on address 1049 in JMRI because byte five had eight binary values from 1041 to 1048. Phew. Let's give it a test then. So with everything switched back on, updated sketches uploaded and the configuration we've just done in JMRI and all of the infrared sensors that are underneath the layout connected to the Arduino through shift registers, input shift registers. Let's see how they're doing. So I'm just going to be a bit uh, crude and push these trains. So let's push the uh, 125 over its sensor there. That's a good sign. The light came on. Same with the uh, class 40 that's here. Yeah, straight on. And then the APT, which is down here. And that's come on. And then we have a super sprinter that I'll pull onto here and that one's lit up and then the very last one is a little bit further back because that's the new one that i just added down there somewhere so i'm gonna somehow try and stretch uh i don't think i can do both on the on the screen at the same time so i'm just going to pull the class 91 that's on that line up and cover that sensor up and there we go that's the extra bit of of line there and that's maybe starting to demonstrate what I'm trying to do here. And that's the, the, the top line along there. That's the That would signify that a long train is parked in that line and that there's room on the end for a short train because, although that's not actually what's, what's happening now, the Class 91 would be parked over this sensor here, but it's so long that it would also be covering this sensor here. So those two lines would be, uh, those two sensors would be covered up, but there'll be a third sensor around down here. Here, because that going by the APT that's about the length of a long train and obviously I need to make sure that I don't get any trains longer than this but really anything longer than these would be too long for the layout anyway there'd be another sensor around here and obviously pushed up the class 91 would have cleared it and if that was free it would mean there's room on the end for a short train as well a quick note maybe on this diagram that I've got as well it's really useful on touch screens because I can zoom it and pan it out so that's about it at its at its full size this is a really useful diagram because it's still got the whole layout on it but there are other ways of doing different graphical diagrams within JMRI, JMRI. I just haven't worked out how to do it yet like for example down here this isn't really all that good if I'm sat in the middle of that I'm, I'm going to struggle to know which line's which so I am intending at some point to do a, a more graphical uh, diagram that will be more readable uh, than than this one is but for now this is testing the functionality well enough so that I know it works and I can do the pretty stuff later so I'm happy with my first two sensors on this line I'm going to finish this line now just so I know that what's in my head is actually going to work so there's another sensor kind of down there somewhere first one up there so both of those occupied would mean there's a long train in this line which indeed there is now um, so I need to make sure there's space on the end to, to bump something short on the end of it. Um, this is my longest short train, if you like. There is an exception in that uh, Transparent Express, but that just has to be an exception. And there's going to have to be some lines that that can't park on, and this is going to be one of them. There's still enough clearance at the back there. If this train was stopped there, stuff would still get past it. So uh, with there not being that much distance even at this point between um, the 101 and the 91 I think the sensor really has to be kind of around here because as soon as it goes over it is going to overrun it a little bit so there'll always be clearance there um, but I obviously don't want too much distance between the sensor and the end of this class 91 because I don't want this running into the back of it so it really is going to have to be right up here the sensor bearing in mind that there will be a little bit of overrun as a train goes over it then one other thing to note 
uh, from a little bit further back here is that when the sensor goes into that gap between the two trains there it's going to be much closer to the Arduino at this end of the loft than it is to the one I've been working on so far down there so I'm gonna um, wire up a couple more shift registers and start pulling shift registers from this one back in that direction as well I've now updated node 3 uh, the sketch on that in exactly the same way as I did node 1 and it now has an input shift register attached to the Arduino as well that's got a sensor attached so I used exactly the same pins exactly the same code exactly the same uh, CMRI byte number so here right at the bottom I've ended up adding a new sensor at, at JMRI ID 3041 because again it's ID 41 after those five bytes previously and the three is because it's on node three rather than node one and I've added a block and a, and I've updated the diagram in exactly the same way so they're fully occupied now there's a line right across that first yard line a red line right across that first yard line quick test then just to make sure it's doing what I want it to do what I expect it to do I'm still just testing this rightmost line along with the class 91 on it the swallow one and that's the line that's currently very red across the middle this the, the top part of the the screen there is kind of the inside of the layout the bit where I walk around so that red line is the line on the very edge at the moment it's entirely occupied I don't know if the video can quite pick it up I think maybe it can there's a class 101 parked behind the class 91 so that line's full and that's being reflected in the diagram so I'm going to try and pull the class 91 away it's a while since I've driven anything on this circuit on this layout so I'm going to be a little bit careful with it I'm going to pull it away quite slowly because it's going to come back in I think just for ease so now I'm going to move the class the, the line, you see the big line where the class 91 was, in fact I'm going to stop this class 91 just so I'm not rushing myself. That line on the diagram where the class 91 was is now free. So the idea would be the class 101 picks up and it trundles along. And it takes its space. Then with just the class 101 on that line, the diagram is then saying that there's a big space at the back. So as the 91, which I'll start again, makes its way around, the idea would be that the layout knows that there's space behind now, behind that 101. In comes the 91 now so initially we'll mark the back bit as occupied and let's slow it down because it's a bit of a slow stopper this one so I'm going to try and react to it again once that middle line is occupied well <laughs> The more observant may have spotted that that didn't go very well. At the very end, a train came over this sensor here and the track diagram didn't, the line didn't go red. So I didn't know that that block was occupied and I drove one train into the back of another one, which is exactly what I'm trying to avoid. Initially, the first thing I checked was the sensor itself under here and that was lighting up as it should. So the next thing I checked was down here I added some debug code to the uh to the, the sketch and the block updates, the updates, because I thought the the newest thing that I've added was the um the shift register, so it's bound to be that, it's bound to be something wrong with that, with the cable or something, but actually no, it was uh behaving as it should and the output log was behaving as it should and 
um, logging changes. So then I came over to the console because I thought, well, if it's not them, it's bound to be the 485 module on the Arduino. But here on the output, that one just next to the zero is the value of byte, uh, byte six, which is currently just one because there's only one sensor attached to the, uh, the first um, pin. So it's either only, only ever going to be one or zero with all those trailing uh, leading zeros and at the minute it's one. And that's correct and that's changing. The, the input coming from the Arduino was changing as and when I parked a train over it. So it's not that. Surprisingly, it's not the 485 module. So then I went and had a look. The kind of next step along is the sensor. So I came and had a look at the sensor. And the sensor was, was setting correctly. So then it was right along to the block and it was the block that wasn't setting as occupied even though the sensor it was attached to was setting as active. And what I found was when it's this line along here, when this sensor wasn't activated, regardless of whether the one at the back was, this block would, would notify me fine. It would be reactive and it, and it would work. But if I just then occupied this sensor this one wouldn't work but of course the one at the back of the three the, the third block would always be occupied so you'd always have this one red and this one red because the train's coming in this direction and it's crossed that one before it's got onto this one and i don't know if it's behavior intended behavior of jmri and i need to find a new way of configuring it but what i found was if this block and this block were occupied then even if a train came into this block, it would never be marked as occupied or be up, sometimes be marked as occupied very, very late, like 20 or 30 seconds after the train entered it. But it's particularly useless. So what I thought I'd try is I've, I, and I read on JMRI, JMRI actually uses its direction. It uses something called beans and something else. It, it basically works out which block follows another one from this diagram. So... I've, I thought, does it, it does it know that these blocks are now following each other and it's doing something like if this block is occupied and this block is occupied, then this one can't possibly be, which seems strange to me. But what I did was I, I deleted the bit of track here that had the third block attached to it and then just added a bit of track that has no block attached to it at all. And now this sensor works fine. So... I need to work out whether this is a bug in JMRI or deliberate behaviour that I'm exposing by configuring my blocks badly. One last bit then on what I've found out about this block occupancy thing. So I've got these three blocks here. Third block, second block, first block. And the di this is the direction left to right that trains come through. What I was finding was now, by joining these three blocks together in this panel, JMRI is, is taking information from that. It's saying, okay, they are adjacent blocks and I will treat them like adjacent blocks. And it appears that it's treatment of adjacent blocks is if both end blocks are occupied, then it's very reluctant to mark the middle block as occupied, even when the sensor that says it's occupied goes to active. I don't know why that is. I think, suspect it's deliberate behavior but I don't know why so what I've done here is I've just moved the first block to the left a tiny little bit and I've put a, a tiny little bit of track just on the diagram with no block assigned to it so now there's a gap between blocks three and two and that does seem to have sorted it out I'm going to try and demonstrate it from here so I'm going to move that class 91 back a bit And there we go, that's become unoccupied. So let's go forward a bit. That's fast. And stop. So let's see what that's done now. It was much more reactive on this point. I was getting the line going red. And over here, quick shaky walk is looking good. And really there's a big gap there now and probably not much distance. It's traveled that far over the sensor. So 
it's not the most dignified way to do it. I should think there's probably better ways to do it. I think I'm working around some a problem rather than solving it. But at least it's got me going forward again. So I'm I'm happy now, even if I have to do it like that, that these three sensors on a on a line do work and will give me the information I need. So I just need to go and get on with adding three sensors to the other eight storage lines which shouldn't actually be as much work because obviously I've already got all those shift registers under the layout now with free uh, pins to, to plug the sensors into. So that's definitely what's next.